Okay, please welcome Helge Mati and Eric Moss from Fabric Engine and their Fabric Engine Canvas presentation. Have fun. Right, so let's uh, move 
as fast as I can possibly speak through this, we can get to self to manage. So there's four pillars that we always talk about. Uh, the first one is performance. I sort of hinted at this, I'll give you a brief demo of something running quickly for the technical guys of you, you'll be able to judge this. And ease of use is really important, like, uh, you know, if you're not that technical, you want to have something you can, you can use easily and also deploy between different levels of experience. Portability is uh, one of the critical aspects, especially for software launch studios, I'd say, which is that our claim is if you build something with Fabric, you can use it everywhere. So it means that you build something for your rig in Fabric inside software launch, you can use the same thing in Maya and the other applications as well without any loss. And finally, extensibility. So extensibility is, is a critical component of our company goals, really. Uh, we want to be able to have uh, any customer, any studio extend whatever we've built. So our claim is from the beginning that we don't want to be a vendor where if you want to change something, you have to call us and pay consult consulting. It's great if you do, but you don't have to. You can change everything. We, the only thing that we don't share code with um, is our computation engine. Um, and for the big customers, we even give that a source code because we don't see any reason not to. All the other things, like the UI for the application, uh, the graph view, all the code, math, geometry code, all the rendering code, uh, all the integration code, like how it works in mind, all these things is all open source. So not open source as in uh, license-wise, but accessible as source code. Great, so we'll get into the demo now. Uh, I'll sit down, you guys can relax a bit. Um, so we'll start with our standalone, and I'll show you a performance-hungry demo. Now, uh, this uh, demo is actually, I managed to open this. Oh, no, don't do this to me now. I'm sorry guys, you'll have to, what we'll do is we'll switch Eric first, I've had this the other day. My machine sometimes decides not to open the shell. So I think what we'll do Eric is we'll switch to you first, that's okay. Yeah. And I'll have the joy of rebooting my computer at the same time. Anyway, so we'll stop, stop this, the recording. It's live, it's live. No, that's fine. That's what you get from not trying at first. You want to switch my Yeah. Sorry guys. Presets that are uh, shipped with uh, with fabric. It's it's a bunch, <laughs> and um, okay, I'm going to close this again and use the tab search instead. So let's start with uh, get torus. I'll select toruses. So here we have a preset. If I enter this um, this uh, node, then we see the subgraph. So here we have three little nodes. Uh, some parameters are exposed. Now I'm going to expose um, these parameters like this and the mesh as well. Now I'm going to close canvas and here in the property page we see those are the things I just exposed. And now I can define in which way um, they are going to be exposed to Softimerge. So we have a communication between Fabric and Softimerge. So 
the mesh port, I'm going to say it's an XSI parameter. No, this is wrong. So the radius, parameter, parameter, and the last, a port. There we go. And here in the main tab, we now have uh, these exact uh, parameters. I change them. Okay, and now uh, here at the last port, polygon mesh port, it's currently not connected, so I'm going to connect it with something in my scene. I'm just going to connect it with self, because this is an empty polygon mesh. And now we see the geometry that is generated by uh, this graph here. Now, to prove that it's really this graph, I'm going to add something, let's say, turbulize node, so this is a little deformation which will deform, turbulize the mesh. So if I close it, and now we see the deformed, turbulized mesh. Uh, here, the parameters, so these are just plain XSI parameters. You can uh, use expressions, you can key them, and so on. And they are then passed here into the graph, they drive the whole graph, and the result is outputted here, and sets the soft merge mesh. Mm. Okay, and now something interesting with these ports is um, let's go in here again and let's do something interesting. I'm going to uh, copy this turbulence thing here and use some other values. So uh, let's use amplitude 0002 and a higher space frequency. Oops, not too high. There you go. And um, Plug this in here, and, and now we have a second uh, mesh port, which pops up here. I'm going to set it tight to port again. And now I will get another empty polygon mesh. Back. There, and now I'm going to connect this port with, uh, yeah, with the empty polygon mesh I just created. And I can move it here. So, um, yeah, this is, uh, is quite interesting. Now we have um, this graph. Uh, it's one graph. It creates one mesh, two different turbulized versions of it, which are passed to soft image, and we can just connect it to the different objects. Um, I could even choose to just uh, use something entirely different. Let's get a sphere. And uh, it's a four and six. Yeah, so this is um, an example of a procedural mesh, and of course you can create um, a much more complex things. Uh, let's take a look at um, yeah, the spheres with sticks. <laughs> okay. Um, good, let's go to shade it. So this again is a procedural mesh entirely generated by uh, fabric. So if we take a look at the property page, here we see the, uh, the few parameters that were exposed. Um, we have a polygon mesh port, and if we take a look at the canvas graph, okay, there we go. So um, yeah, this is pure graph where we have a sphere, and it gets turbulized over time. Um, here we uh, scatter positions on, on the mesh, and then we use the positions to create uh, these cubes here. And, um, okay, uh, I don't know, um, well, for the soft image users know that uh, soft image can be a bit slow when, when you pass, when you generate geometry for it. And um, Fabric has a nice uh, thing called inline drawing, which um, it kind of hijacks the, the port, the viewport of soft image, and you can draw di directly into the viewport and SoftImage doesn't even know about it. And um, if you press playback, it's, the playback is not very fast. So let's go in here and we're going to add a little functionality. So let's get a if we expose the bool, this will be, let's call this port um, draw only. OK. So and if this is set, um, oh yeah. Okay, if this is not set, then we're going to actually set our, our polygon mesh, like this. And here, poly, poly, and key. Wow. Right, and if we're only drawing, then we're going to set an empty mesh. I'm going to copy this, and we're going to do the opposite, like this. Okay, 
And now we're going to get a draw, it's called a draw mesh. And this little guy here will draw the mesh directly into the viewport. Okay, and now here we have the tab, and if I, oh sorry, uh, draw this, let's snap from the tab. Okay, and now well, this is not, an, if I try to select it, I can't, because SoftImage doesn't even know it's there. And um, so you see the playback is much smoother. If I switch back again, this is the real mesh. So this is quite interesting. You can build um, a procedural geometry generated by fabric, like heavy ge geometry, and choose to now pass it to SoftImage. Just display it so that you can tweak stuff and get it all pretty and animated. And then when you know it's good, you switch your thing and you get the real mesh and then you can do, what well, render it and so on. Um, another nice thing, Maya, sorry, soft mesh falls. <laughs> uh, no, I just want to quickly show how you can, what we just built in soft image, how we can take parts of it and just copy paste it into, into Maya, for example. Uh, let me get a theme called uh, Ocean Simple Plane. Okay, I'm not. This I didn't test, so Great. fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is Maya. Here we have a, a mesh, and you'll see that the workflow is pretty much the same. Um, we have again this open canvas button, which would be this one here. So if I open canvas, we see uh, the graph that generates uh, this mesh here. So here I'm going to just take what I constructed here, press Control c go back to Maya, and paste it in here. There you go. And now we just uh, hook it up. So this goes here, this goes here, and we expose the boolean like this. And let's hope it works. Okay. Das vergessen nicht zu verbinden. Oh. Rechten Output sind schon nicht verbunden. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, I need of course to expose this. Thank you, Helga. <laughs> okay. And yay, it works. Okay. Oh, uh, the, 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 it flips because the mesh is uh, translated. Okay. There you go. Okay. Uh, now it's correct. So we, so we have um, the same construct, the thing we just built in Softimage, we copied it over. And this is, of course, the great thing uh, about Fabric that um, you can just, you write a tool and you can be sure that you can use it in any other Fabric version, be it Modo or Maya or Houdini and all what's, what's up to come. Good, that was uh, my quick little demo. I uh, hope this thing is up and running again. Yes, great. <laughs> <laughs> plugged in an audio device, that's right. So uh, I actually missed something in the beginning of the presentation, not even did my computer crash, but also I missed something. So one of the things we always say is that for five years we have done a pretty bad job at explaining what Fabric actually is. So finally we hired someone to explain it for us. Uh, so a shout out to our friends at Electric Umbrella in uh, Hamburg. They did a small explanatory video, so I'm going to show that video now. Apologies if it's too loud, I'll try to uh, adapt it pretty quickly. So, oh, we don't hear anything, do we? That enables everyone to build powerful tools. This is Fabric Engine, the digital content creation platform that enables everyone to build powerful tools and applications for visual effects, games, virtual reality, visualization, and more. And this is you. You're an artist or an animator, a technical director or an R&D programmer, or perhaps you're a freelancer doing a little bit of everything. Whether you want to accelerate animation rates, build procedural geometry tools, 
view and edit huge amounts of data, or create next generation virtual reality experiences, Fabric Engine makes it easy for you to build the tools you need to get the job done. Fabric does this through KL and Canvas. KL is Fabric Engine's language, and it's how you speak to the multi threaded core that makes Fabric applications fly. KL is easy. If you can write Python or JavaScript, then you'll pick it up in no time. We also give you Canvas, a visual programming system that opens up KL to everyone. With Fabric, you don't need to write a single line of code if you don't want to. Whichever you choose, code, nodes, or both, Fabric Engine gives the same amazing performance. But we know you're not working alone. You need to move tools and data across teams, send updates to your clients, get assets to and from freelancers, and even collaborate with other studios. Your tools need to support many applications, run on multiple platforms, and provide consistent results wherever they're used. Fabric makes it easy. On top of being a standalone framework, Fabric runs inside many common applications and across all major operating systems. This really is right once, deploy everywhere. Helping to reduce the cost and risk of supporting modern production pipelines and making it easy for your team to use the best tools for the job at hand. And Fabric can be extended to do much more. Integrate your custom libraries, work with specialized hardware, hook Fabric into your in-house tools. Fabric can support it all, becoming the unifying platform for your pipeline and making everything go faster. Your tools, your production, your team, you. Fabric Engine. I think it's a pretty good presentation, actually. It's interesting to see for me because, yeah, like I said, we've been trying to, to explain this for a long time and finally somebody else with graphical understanding uh, had to look at it. So I think it, it, it gets it pretty clear. So let me skip through the things we've already shown and uh, get to, to the demos. Uh, so I'll skip the performance demo just due to timing. Uh, all the demos that we're showing today are on our website. So the demo I was going to show you is an n-body simulation. It's a, a particle simulation which does gravitational force across particles, uh, which is a really slow algorithm to write. Um, and what you we should have seen is a small particle simulation, which is fast. Um, we have it on our website. One of the things to say about performance, though, is that uh, one of the cool features of LLVM is that it has backends for different types of hardware. So one of the backends we use is, uh, as you guys all know, this is the x86 target, so the CPU, uh, things that you use in your computers right now, but you also usually spend a lot of money on GPUs. Um, in the VFX industry, a lot of people are using NVIDIA GPUs. Um, so we have a backend for that too, which means that most of the code you write with KL or the graphs you build with Canvas, you can run directly on NVIDIA GPUs as well uh, if you choose to use Fabric Engine for the job. It's a pretty big statement uh, to make I do not have an NVIDIA GPU in my computer, which is a big complaint towards my boss. Uh, anyway, uh, we have all these benchmarks and all these things on our website, so go ahead and have a look at the, the things there. Essentially, our claim is here, usually uh, you have to do a cost, cost and risk analysis if you want to do something with a GPU. You have to hire someone, you know, CUDA is hard to write, so you first have to figure out, does it even make sense to do this on the GPU? Is it going to be faster? How much money is it going to save me? And all this stuff. With Fabric, really, what we're saying is, we're not getting the parity with well-written CUDA, but it's free, so you can just try it out. If it's faster, use it. If it's not faster, you don't. Um, but there's no cost and risk analysis involved. Um, plus, those of you guys who don't know how to program at all, it still works. Um, great, ease of use. So let's get go through some demos. I'll actually do one demo that's going to cover sort of a try, uh, ease of use and portability. Um, Eric has already hinted at some of these things, uh, and you've seen uh, for an ICE user, it's fairly straightforward to use, and some of the paradigms you'll see there are pretty much the same. I'll try to cover Canvas a little bit more uh, in depth and explain how it works. So amazingly, I now have a shell, which wasn't working before. Don't ask me why. Uh, I had the joy of doing a London trip prior to this and the night before my machine crashed. So I'm happy it even works at all. Um, right, so this is our standalone. Um, it's a small application you can use to build graphs uh, and it comes with a variety of UI features. Um, as you've already seen, the UI in Maya and Softimage are exactly identical, and they're also identical here. Uh, it's one of the philosophy decisions to say, you know, we want uniformity in UI. It's important that once you've learned it, you should be able to go into Houdini Open Canvas and feel familiar, and it should be the same experience. Um, so what we're looking at here is a small graph. I can just start adding a node, and we'll get to a slightly more complex setup in a second. Now, each one of these nodes uh, can be either a KL function, so it can have KL code in it, or it can be a subgraph. That's pretty much all the nodes we have. And with that, you can model um, you know, pretty much any uh, program, really. 
So we have an integrated Kale editor in here, so you can just double click this, get to the code, and you can also write nodes directly within here. Uh, so if you decide that something is missing in the node library or you want to do something because you're tech savvy, you can just go ahead and say, give me a new function, call it my function, something like that. Uh, dive in, I'll do this as fast as I can. Um, and then you, you, know, you say I have a float and B is another input and we have an output uh, and then we just say, in our case, uh, C is A plus two times B, something like that. Uh, you compile it, you go back up and there's your node and now you can use it. And what's really important to get here is that this is not a compromising performance whatsoever. Uh, the performance you're gonna get out of this node is the same as if we were set down and use Visual Studio and go through all the iteration cycles to write a Maya plugin to finally get to a node that does this. Uh, you can do it directly within the environment and you can start trying it out immediately. So for you guys to trust this a little bit more, let's try use some more nodes. I'll show you one of the samples we built for SIGGRAPH uh, this year, which is a procedural geometry generator. So it's a small, smart graph that can build a spider web. Um, don't judge the visual quality of the spider web, please. Uh, I did my best. So what you can see here is a bunch of polygons. Uh, they're all little tubes there. They're pro pro uh, procedurally built. Uh, so what you'll see is a small graph down here that spills it. But don't be fooled, it's actually a pretty big graph. It's just we've uh, used subgraphs a lot. So if you dive in here on the left, uh, what we're doing is we're first creating a bunch of points. So this node is what we call the spiderweb circle, uh, and it creates a point in the center and then creates a circle around it uh, for the base points. So you have controls over you know, how many points do you have, uh, how random is this distribution of these points, and so on. And then you get through uh, more of these. So the next one is the base. These are the lines that go from the outer circle to the center of the spiderweb, and finally the rings. So you have control over how many loops you have and all that stuff. Now each one of these nodes uh, is a subgraph, and the, some of these you'll see, it's actually quite a bunch of nodes in it. If I would have to choose how to build it, I'd probably have more, built more code. However, it was a requirement for all the content I built for SIGGRAPH that it's possible to build it purely visually. Uh, the reason for this is that we wanted to prove out that the system's actually complete. So I had to, you know, of course I can just write nodes, but some of our users won't be able to do. So we need to make sure that this kind of stuff works uh, purely visually. So if you dive in, you can see there's some uh, arrays being filled, and then there's some rotations being built up to create the circle. Some of the other ones are fairly complex, so if you dive in, you'll see there's quite some array logic going on. Like I said, some of the stuff I would have just built uh, as code, but you know, we need to prove out you can actually do it uh, visually. Now finally, uh, I want to show you one of these over here, which is interesting, like the fill interpolated. Uh, what it does, it takes two values and a count and builds an array, which has an interpreted list of all these values. So in this case, it's used for the rotation from 0 to 360 degrees. So if you go in, you can see there's a bit of code in here. Um, and it's a small loop and it fills the array. Uh, you don't have to understand the code. What I'm trying to say is how our system works. So basically, the way the canvas works is it writes code for you, literally. There's no difference if you're writing the code yourself or if you're using the UI. What happens is we go all the way down to the last nodes which have code in them. And then when the compiler gets this code, it will go back up and build this node here, this group, as a function. So it will build more code that describes basically this graph. And then we'll finally go up all the way here and build the full application. So what it does, it builds a small program that builds their spider web for you. I and mean, there's a bunch of things that's really important here to get. Uh, the first one is there's no compromise. If you want to build code, fine. You can do that. You, you'll get the performance you want. If you don't know how to write code, you use the nodes for it, uh, there's no compromise either. So the performance is on parity. It doesn't matter if you're choosing the visual approach um, or the code approach. The other thing, and this is more technical, but it's very important, is that because we run, we run our code through the LVM compiler, which does a lot of optimizations on the code, restructures it, does all this stuff, you get a lot of performance benefits, and you also get these benefits when you're using the graph, which is a pretty big deal. In other words, it's really fast. Um, so what we can do now is we can take this graph, as Eric has done it, um, and make this a smart asset. So we'll say, this portion of the graph here builds our mesh. I haven't explained all of it. Um, but you can sort of see it's one of the samples how it works um, if you get the software. So we'll move to Modo. Instead of Modo, for example, we can go ahead and choose one of our shapes types. So we'll make it a procedural mesh. Get that shape type. Names are subject to change, by the way, Eric. This is not great. <laughs> uh, anyway, so we'll fire up the UI here, uh, paste it in, uh, and then we have our mesh over here, and then we can just connect it up. 
And now uh, we have the mesh and modo. So the way it works, we'll use the compiled version of this, which is already have. We can, of course, just edit the graph here as well. So we have all the options that we have in all the other things. Uh, as you've seen, you know, we have tap search for finding things quickly. So if you want to do, I don't know, VEC3 compose, you can just type that in. You get all the different versions of that. We also have a tree view where you can search for things. So you can see here, because you have access to that here as well. If, and all the math stuff, for example, you can find here. Um, so the UI is always the same. Uh, it might try to adapt to the Qt style. So you'll see in Moto, it follows the Moto style, but the capabilities are all the same. And of course, I can also edit everything. So here, you know, we have the same controls I was showing you before. Uh, I can change some of the settings of the spider web, and we'll get an actual Moto mesh. So as you can see, these are polygons in Moto. We get access to that here. Now, of course, like I said before, we also have to support Maya in there. Uh, so. Uh, we also have an integration in Maya. The way it works in Maya is that we have a generic node in Maya. So if you just type canvas node, uh, this will open up our system, create a compiler, does all that stuff. So it takes a couple seconds. Uh, once it's done, you have a node which by itself doesn't have any content. So you can see it doesn't have any attributes or anything on it. So you fire up the canvas. Um, if you want, you can also drop that in here. Then as soon as you start using it, let me just make this smaller. Uh, and you start, for example, I just put the VEX3 in again. Uh, you start exposing things out. Maya starts reflecting these. And you can see how now you can connect the two worlds. So as soon as you put stuff, expose it from Canvas, it shows up in the GCC. And then you can start connecting it with the other things in the scene. Um, so of course, the spider web, let me show that to you. I have it somewhere. Uh, works similar to what, what Eric has shown before. So you know the spider web uh, in Maya is a shape node. Uh, which has a canvas graph in it, so you'll see the same things somewhere. So there's our spider web. Uh, we've exposed some of the settings, so I can change these things and can drive them, animate them in Maya the same way you would with everything else. Um, and this is sort of the main claim for you guys, I would say, is that if, you, if you're in the process of transitioning and you're building ice graphs, you're building these kind of tools, you're caught within Softimage. You know, I am a big fanboy of ice. I mean, I worked on it for f over five years, so I understand it's hard to let go. I'm just saying, you, once you've done this, you know, you can move it to other applications um, and you, you sustain the value and the work you've put into this. Um, all right, so one last one I want to show you for the spider web uh, is this one. So this is Unreal Engine. Um, is it really interesting now for about six months since they've changed their business model to it being free? Uh, I guess a lot of people are interested. So we figured, you know, let's integrate uh, Canvas directly into Unreal Engine as well so that you can use your assets there directly. So we show you two examples, starting with the spider web. Uh, first, I want to explain you how it works. So we've integrated into Blueprint. Uh, Blueprint is Unreal Engine's graph system. It's also a compiled graph. So it really works well with us because they do similar things. Um, so everywhere in Blueprint, you can just create a Fabric Engine node, as you can see here. Uh, the Fabric Engine node, uh, we haven't integrated the UI yet, so you can load graphs you've built somewhere else. Um, and for that, you will need a persisted file. So I've saved the spider web to disk. Let me just find and mute my computer. Great. Um, find that spider web file. So I'll just get the path for that, like this. We go back here and paste. Uh, what happens is our compiler will go in, f open the file, find the exposed data, and then create pins for all the things you've exposed inside of a Blueprint, and then you can start hooking it up to the game. Um, this means that this works great for animation. Like if you build something that does your camera animation or procedural tools there, moves lights, whatever, you can do that. You can uh, move things around in Unreal. You can also use uh, meshes. So the way it works in Unreal, and this is getting fairly technical, um, but you have to build an object class. So you build a new class of type uh, object, I've built one which is called a spider web, um, and it has a small blueprint graph in it, as you can see. It uses the spider web file, exposes a couple of settings, and uses some of our nodes that you can use to drive a mesh. Um, so if you drop this in here and you scale it up, it's really small by default. And you can see here's our spider web. You can see we have all the controls that we had before. We can clone it, for example, change its settings for each one, um, and it becomes a utility. So you have to see it as something, this is, you know, it's now a procedural tool to dress your set. Uh, and it has all the capabilities as a normal actor in Unreal. You can put shaders on it, put textures on it, and all the things you might be used to uh, from here. Now, spider webs are great. Uh, I do think so. But uh, one of the things that's a big problem with game engines is the destructive pipelines that you have. Usually, you know, game engines are great at showing a lot of stuff, but it's hard to get things in there. Now, with Unreal, for, since 4.8, they've had FBX, pretty strong support. It's great. It still means you're losing a lot of flexibility uh, trying to move things in. The other thing that you have with game engines is if you want to get performance, you will have to sacrifice some polygon counts. 
So the stuff I see here behind behind my computer, a plane with 30 million polygons is not going to work. Like no matter how smooth the pipeline is, it's just gonna, not going to fly within the engine. So you have to have things which can reduce polygons and do this sort of stuff. And our spider web is procedural. So if you have, if you're using one of the nodes we'll provide, which is polygon reduction, as part of your smart asset, you can pull your live data and pull it directly in. Uh, I don't have polygon reduction yet, but I'll show you another one which is fairly interesting. So this is an alembic asset. Uh, it's a generic tool, and what it does, it takes an alembic path and an index of a mesh within the alembic file and then pulls it into Unreal directly. So you don't have to export it anything. You just have a library of things. So we've taken a TurboSquid file, which is like a library of buildings uh, from like a construction site. Um, and then you can just, you know, do the things. I'm a great artist, as you can see. Put some shaders on it, uh, clone it, you know, with Alt, drag it with Alt, change the index of the mesh, um, plug on that, use some of the other buildings. And as you can see, the pipeline is really fast. You literally like quickly dress up the set like this, um, and it's always referencing the alembic file as you would in Maya or Softimage. Now this means you know data moves freely without loss between the worlds, and it, this is where it gets really really interesting. Um, all right, looking at the time, I'll switch back to the presentation. And I'll take questions after. So really, what we're saying, uh, we have a presentation of a truck, which is why you're seeing the truck. Really, we should be showing the spider web in this case, I suppose. What we're saying is, you know, usually pipelines you have. Split steps, you have uh, modeling, texturing, moto, for example, and then you have some stuff happening in other applications and you move things around. Finally, you get to the interactive world and everything's baked and all you can do is walk around, uh, for example. Um, what we're proposing, and careful, this is like Star Trek Borg-like now, but uh, what we're proposing is sort of like make everything as part of the smart asset. Build something that can load a file, massage the data, reduce the polygons, I don't know, do something to it, and then return it back to Maya and real moto, but in the same way everywhere. So that way, once you've built it, you can, of course, also build it in self uh, you can use it everywhere. And it becomes a portable, we say, smart, intelligent assets. Um, the last thing uh, I'll try to show you within like a minute is extensibility. So uh, for those of you who don't like code, apologies, I'll show you some code now. Um, so what we'll do is we will have uh, a look at one of the extensions that I built for SIGGRAPH, which is the Leap Motion. So some of you guys might be familiar with this device. It's a, a hand sensor which allows you to track skeletal motion in the hand. Uh, it's okay-ish for basic motion data, uh, motion capture, but you know, given it's a path of like 80 euro to get into the subject, it's, it's quite good. Um, so what I did is I wrote the API. So I'll just show you some of the things and how you do this, and I'll get to the point why this is so important. Um, so I'll show you one of the classes that Leap Motion comes with, which is called the Leap Arm. It represents the arm model of the tracking. So you have the Leap Arm is pretty rich. What it has, it has a direction. That's it. So you have you have direction and a roll or something like this. And so what I had to write is the KL code for the mapping. So you can see. Uh, let's just focus on this one here. Uh, it's a method. It's called Leap Direction. Gives a vector three back. Leap Arm Direction. So I literally only wrote this line. I copied some of the comments from the Air API. So we have them here. Then we ran all this stuff through the tool. Um, I wrote all these classes. It took about say like about two hours. Uh, then I ran this through a tool that we built, uh, which is able to auto-generate all the C++ bindings. So here is the auto-generated C++ code. Um, so I won't get into any details, but uh, the important thing is this is fully auto-generated. So you write the KL, you can generate the C++ bindings, and you get your KL code running, and then you can use leap motion in KL. Now, great, you have it in KL. The next thing you can do, we also provide an automated system for, uh, is 100% automatic is you can build all the nodes for Canvas for all the API that you have automatically. So once you have leap arm, you have leap finger and all this stuff, you can just say, give me Canvas nodes for all this stuff so I don't have to write code anymore. Um, so I'll show you the results of this. Uh, there's a folder structure being generated for this. You can see there's the leap arm functions. And then finally, you have the direction preset, the direction node, and it sort of describes itself to the system. You see there's a port going in, leap arm, a result, which is vector three, so a direction of the arm, and then down there, there's a code. And all this stuff is auto-generated for you. So what does that mean? Well, now, once you've done this, and I'll be honest, it's like, I think it's a day of work for somebody who hasn't touched the system yet, who's technical. Um, so now you can just say, uh, leap arm, direction. Here's our node. You can start using it, even if you don't know how to code at all. If you tooltip over it, you get the original comments from the API, so you, all this stuff gets pulled across, so it's auto-documenting itself and all this. Um, and then you can start building stuff. So I'll show you one thing I built, which is uh, I got laughed at by the big studios. Uh, <laughs> the reason is I said it's a use case for production, and it's, it's not really. Um, so what I tried to explain here, though, is now we have an environment where we have devices. We can experiment with motion capture data from simple devices, of course, big devices as well. Um, we have asset loading and saving in this. We have real-time rendering in this. So you can start getting pretty creative. 
Um, so one of the things I do here now is down here, we create a leap controller. We stick it in a cache so that it survives uh, each frame. Then we ask, these are all calls directly from the API. So if you hover, you can see this is actually calling to the API. Say, give me the last frame from the device. Give me all the hands, give me one of the hands and so on. And then there's two things that happen. The first stuff you open up here, uh, what it does, it creates a camera matrix. So I won't explain you how this works, but trust me, it does a camera matrix. Down here, there's a small graph, it's really small. It just says, give me a certain finger and then measure the distance between the basis of the hand and the finger. So it's really basic. It just says, if the finger is pretty close, do something. And then here we have setting up the K real time camera from the matrix we have. I have no idea why I crossed these two sections, by the way, it doesn't really make sense. Anyway, up here, we have an alembic loader. And what we do with this finger gesture is, it's kind of imaginative, we switch the asset. So I decide I want to have something where I can move my hand and I can look at the asset and when I use my finger, it's like this, this little gesture, I'm going to flip through the assets. Uh, and depending on, this is going to be awkward, depending on how sweaty I am, it works. Sometimes I've noticed in the, during the last trip, sometimes the switching doesn't work. So apologies in, in this case, if it doesn't work. So now, you know, you can use, let me make this a little bigger. Now I can use my hand, I can move around, and I can use my finger if it works. Come on, give me a break. Anyway, trust me that sometimes it works. Yeah, you can see it sort of works sometimes. Um, so when you, know, when you do that, you can now interact with this. So of course, I realize this is not the reality of production. But what I'm trying to say here is, within a day, we've extended our system with a complete new hardware device, with visual programming for the hardware device. And if you know ICE or Maya and the policies of uh, the company we don't talk about of, in terms of how, lo how long does the changes take, what we're saying is this is going to be a growing system pretty quickly because everybody can extend it. Uh, we don't claim the right to extend this stuff. You should always be able to do this by yourself and not be dependent on us. So nearly done. So we'll have some more slides and we're done. Um, this is some of the slides for the bigger studios, but it also applies to you guys. So usually in pipelines, you know, you have all the five formats that you want to need to deal with and all the libraries, eventual hardware that you guys want to deal with, and then all the software that you want to deal with at the bottom. And usually what it creates is kind of this kind of like, you know, you guys all know this. We have this FBX file. We have to first bring it into Max 13, and then we get it in Max 14, and then we put it in Maya, and finally it works somehow. And these kind of workflows are just crazy. Um, and so, you know, I, I realize this looks a little bit politically weird, but what we're just saying is, as long as it works with Fabric, and Fabric is supported by us and all the applications, it will be a continuous pipeline. Um, so lastly, I want to say one and uh, thanks some of our customers. Um, sharing is caring. What this means is that, you know, our customers have been sharing stuff back to us, and it's, it's been an amazing time, really, because I'd say, like, for the last 10 years, you guys have seen this, too. It's like things like Alembic come around, uh, the industry changes, people like to work together and sort of have to also because of budgets. And so, you know, thanks to PSYOP, they're sharing some of the work they're doing on the Arnold integration, they're sharing that back to us. Uh, Whiskey Tree is doing something similar for scene assembly. NPC has done some huge things. They have integrated RenderMan uh, completely into Fabric and provide that back to us together with Pixar. Uh, they're sharing their Houdini integration with us, so they're doing the Houdini work and giving it back to us. Double Negative is integrating some of the things into Viewpoint 2.0 and Maya, so they're doing some work on the real-time rendering side. Ubit has been doing a full character rigging system called Kraken, uh, which is completely cross DCC. You can take character rigs, character rigs from Maya to Softimage to Max, uh, all open source, pretty amazing. And Nozam is doing something with Oculus Rift and, and uh, for virtual reality. So it's, it's really cool that you, you can see that people actually share stuff back. I also want to say, you know, we also try to do our part. So we give Fabric away for free for individuals. Uh, we give 50 licenses to studios for free, which is kind of a tricky phrase. Really, it's 10 interactive and 40 uh, render licenses, but it's there free. So, uh, and we also realize, like some people tell us, it's sort of like a street dealer technique. You give 10 and then you kind of like, but we realize that, but come on, it's, we have to start somewhere. Um, so then moving on, this is just the last slide. Uh, moving to 2.0 after the release. So Canvas uh, 2.0 is going to be out by the end of September. So in about two weeks, it's going to be public. Uh, you'll be able to just go to a website, say get canvas, um, download it for Softimage Maya and so on for free. Um, after that release, we're going to be focusing on two other big, big pieces that we need for full application services. Uh, we're working on a new real-time renderer that's going to be a full-featured, uh, broad real-time renderer system. Um, and Scene Hub, which is our in-memory scene representation. So once you have a scene system to represent referenceable scenes and all that stuff, and a real-time renderer, uh, and a processing engine, you know, you can kind of see where we're trying to get to. One important thing to say, though, is we're not trying to build Maya. All we're saying is we build a platform with all the pieces that people can build applications for themselves. Right? How are we doing on time? I think we're nearly good. So thank you. Thanks a lot.
take maybe questions for two minutes. If there's any. Say the name of the rigging, the rigging tool again. It's, it's called Kraken. Kraken. The reason was they wanted to be able to say release the Kraken. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not joking. It's really the, it's the end of it. Good, good choice. <laughs> Anything else? All right, I guess you guys are just all filled up with information, so thanks. <laughs> thanks.